So I go now to the presentation of Ms. Zane Virgi, um, and the topic of her talk is Coronavirus in Africa, the impact and adjustments on the continent. Zane Virgi is one of the world's most respected and recognized journalists. With an action-packed background and experience as a storyteller, entrepreneur, communicator, and interviewer. She's well known as a former CNN anchor and correspondent and has made a successful transition into the world of communications and creative entrepreneurship. Her communications firm, Zane Virgie Group, has worked with a deep lineup of organizations and entities such as MasterCard Foundation, Bloomberg Media, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Fitzer Inc., Equity Group Foundation of Kenya, World Health Organization, GE Africa, OCP, the Aga Khan Development Network, the MISC Foundation, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And she's worked with them on their communications and public relations delivery and strategies via advisory, consulting, and content production. She's a highly sought after facilitator and interviewer, and has spoken on platforms such as TED and Africa House. Zane is a senior fellow, non-resident, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Africa program. She's a guest opinion columnist on African issues for the national UAE. Zane is also a startup founder and content creator, co-founding Acoma Media, a continental network of workspaces for Africa's creative and cultural economy in 2015. Her other ventures in the creative space include Amplify, a content creator fellowship with participants from East West Africa and the US in partnership with MasterCard Foundation. In addition, with her former colleague and CNN anchor Isha Sese, Sane launched Rouse, an immersive three-day gathering event for an elite community of women in Africa and the diaspora in 2019. Zane resides in the Los Angeles area and Nairobi, Kenya, and her versatility and charisma, as you will see in just a minute, have been a great asset for her in her post-anchor life and entrepreneurial ventures. We'll now listen to Zane. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Jambo, as we say in Swahili. My name is Zane Virgi. I am from Kenya. I am a storyteller and a story maker. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a student of Stoicism. I am a runner, and in fact, I am the fastest Kenyan in West Los Angeles. So to be honest, that actually means I am pretty slow. <laughs> Today I want to share with you a view of Africa via my lenses. Behind each one of these lenses and these words are a number of stories and characters that tell them really well. My mantra, a mantra that I am fully invested in is this, that the storyteller is the most important person in Africa today. Why? Because it's the storyteller that sets the vision and the values of an entire generation. It's the storyteller that roots life in their reality. And it's the storyteller who can export a country's soft power to the entire world. And that is absolutely critical in the work that I do. And this is my story. Since leaving CNN, I have focused on Africa. In my travels across the continent, what I saw was actually not what I read in international and in mainstream news media. In every single African country I spent time in, I saw resilience, energy, investment, brilliance, and power. I met so many incredible people with whom I have formed lifetime professional and personal bonds. All of these people have become so critical in my transition from TV talent to media entrepreneur. And I would love to introduce you to some of these people here today. Before COVID, Chidi, that's my business partner and I, built a company called Akoma. And we created a digital platform where Africans could tell authentic, and compelling stories that truly reflected the beauty and the diversity of the continent. We immersed ourselves in the African creative community, discovering and training and working with so many different creatives right across the African continent. Our biggest success and our gem, if I might say, is Amplify, 
a creative content and talent accelerator where creatives from various countries came together in cohorts to learn and to collaborate. And they were inspired to see beyond their limitations and achieve much greater heights than they ever dreamed. Unfortunately, though, our company, Acoma, ultimately failed because it became clear that we built the wrong platform, we pursued the wrong business model, but we did prove that there was a problem that needed to be solved in African storytelling and that the market was simply waiting for it. So we did what all people do as entrepreneurs, we pivot. So as Acoma was winding down, Chidi and I embarked on another adventure in the creative space around Africa. In 2018, we had this cool opportunity to program events at Africa House. It was a pop-up event space in a historic mansion in New York City during the United Nations General Assembly. The team essentially curated original panels and speakers that truly resonated around the topics and discussions on the African continent. And we made sure that there was a strong dose of the diaspora participating. There were also a few heads of state and key business leaders that attended and you know, even Naomi Campbell stopped by. We were excited about that. Last year, we had a wonderful opportunity to design and launch the Fearless Women of Africa during the World Economic Forum in Cape Town. As you're telling now that we were starting to grow our events and planning shots. The Fearless Women event with Pfizer was not only a great showcase for African women that we had come across in our journey, both known and unknown, that were doing great things on the continent, but it was actually also a powerful showcase of our burgeoning and innovative events, design and execution capabilities. It was very important for us to show ourselves that we could do events in a way that no one else was thinking about. So one of the highlights of our journey so far was Rouse. Rouse was a culmination of our desire to put together a marquee event for women of African descent. And it was created with my former CNN colleague, Aisha Sese, Chidi, as well as another friend of ours, Sunita Olimpio. We held the inaugural gathering in Marrakesh last year with a cross section of amazing women from the continent and the diaspora. And we had an incredible three days together. We brought 45 women to a beautiful location in Morocco with bonding and conversations around Africans in Africa, Africans in the diaspora, and African Americans. With Rouse, we really believed that we were tapping into a rare space that very few venture into with women of African descent because what tends to happen is that they're usually just put in silos. You fit there and you fit there, whether it be from an events approach standpoint or otherwise. I'll tell you something though, Rouse women are a force to be reckoned with around the world today and are in all kinds of industries. <clears throat> I've also worked with Equity Group Foundation. They are based in Kenya. And they're really an amazing organization because they have developed a new model of philanthropy in Africa that can actually be applied to the rest of the world today. Equity is a bank and the foundation's services and the delivery of them are built over the formal infrastructure of the far reaching branches of Equity Bank. The bank gives 2% of its annual revenue to the foundation and it basically absorbs some of the typical operational costs that a foundation would encounter. So I've been very excited to learn about this model over the years, as well as to see it grow. I should also mention that I grew a strong friendship over many years. I became friends with a certain foreign minister of Ethiopia, a dedicated, elegant and brilliant man who is now the Director General of the World Health Organization. As he took the reins at WHO, Dr. Tedros had asked me to look at the communication setup in Geneva and kind of offer some analysis and thoughts. That was when he first took over. While I was in Geneva, I met some dynamic and committed people that I'm actually still in touch with today and serves me well when I'm trying to understand the landscape of COVID in Africa. All of these things I'm mentioning here were done in the space of six years since I left CNN. And at the core of every one of them is my belief 
in elevating and pushing Africa's soft power and showcasing individuals and entities that help project that soft power. This is the DNA of what I do. Twenty twenty was going to be a, a big transition year for me, right? A coma was essentially over. We had cried. We were done. We were also getting a good amount of attention on the events design and planning side, as I mentioned. As we were gearing up, boosted by the momentum of twenty nineteen, and really excited about our lineup and the opportunities in front of us, looked like they would finally, finally provide the financial lift that we had been seeking after so many rough years in the messy middle of entrepreneurship, COVID hit, boom. And in the spirit of the hustle of entrepreneurship, we just had to go back to the drawing board. The most difficult and profound global event was quite surprising. It provided plenty of openings for us to take advantage of everything that I had learned, everyone that I had met, all the skills I had accrued and applied to Africa. Many of the people I met over the years became front and center of the COVID conversations on the continent. And here we are. My Rouse sister, Julie Gushuru, who's the head of MasterCard Communications and from their, for their foundation, reached out and discussed the vision behind a digital platform that would capture the stats and the numbers that really told the COVID story in Africa. She requested this, that we explore the development of a dashboard for COVID-19's data and information and, and dedicated to Africa the goal was to generate a platform that was high-end, that showed Africa's design and product prowess, and made sure that the information was presented in a delightful and useful way to the African community. So we really put our heads together and came up with this. Please go to this website, covidhqafrica.com. The thing is, Chidi is one of the best product guys out there, so I lucked out. Together, we built this website. The WHO relationship came into play because we were able to use data and receive encouragement and support for this initiative. Our development partners came up with a useful bot and this kind of data visualization that has truly resonated. We are very excited about this. And for the first time, also exciting <laughs> for me, is that I've worked with my brother Irfan without fighting who's also on the development team side. I have learned an enormous amount from him. And we all understand how to approach the continent because we know the regions, we understand the diversity, we understand the narrative and the needs, and we don't approach Africa as one big monolith. Africa is not a country. Chidi and I and the MasterCard Foundation team, along with Namu Communications, are building now a powerful content strategy. And what we're doing is applying everything that we learned and avoiding all the many mistakes we made before. It was truly striking too, at the beginning of this, how close this project hit home for both Chidi and I. His father's a PhD and lives in Nigeria, and his dad was even skeptical that COVID was real. So if a PhD is doubting COVID, then imagine what the rest of the continent is thinking. Is my family. <laughs> my own mother and father are in Kenya and both of them have significant underlying health issues. So like everybody else around the world, I have been frightened at the toll COVID could take on my own family in Africa. Before COVID, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies were in Africa. Africa was coming out of a commodities crisis, diversifying its economic base especially in North and East Africa. Some of those economies were actually growing between six to eight percent. That is pretty powerful. Some of the challenges, however, faced by Africa before COVID that have been exacerbated and are more pronounced now because of the pandemic are these. Africa has had generally weak health systems, things like ICU beds and, and units and ventilators. According to the OECD, 
Africa actually spends 12 US dollars a year on health per capita versus $4,000 in the UK. The infrastructure of the biggest cities on the continent also is an issue, where the majority of our population live in overcrowded neighborhoods, where there is very little reliable access to clean water and to sanitation. Actually, 85% of Africa's populations are in the informal sector. They're informal sector workers. They can't work from home like I am or you may be. They are day laborers and they live hand to mouth and they have to earn to survive. Their immunity is often compromised as well. You know, our populations have HIV, HIV, TB, malaria. And so that makes the COVID danger most threatening. The awesome part is that countries in Africa move quickly. Contingencies and mitigation plans were implemented fast. I'll give you a few examples, right? Um, Rwanda had a full and a fast lockdown. Kenya had a curfew, social distancing, tax cuts. When you looked at Nigeria, and they have the Ebola experience, right? Immediate temperature testing at airports was instated and emergency spending. Togo, the president uh, uh, put out an innovative mobile cash and transfer system. Ethiopia, as well as many other nations, started to manufacture their own PPEs. Senegal, that's made the news recently, has a startup that instantly started to develop cheap rapid test kits. I mentioned earlier, that I had met a number of incredible people along this journey who I now work with and all of whom are true stars for the continent in their own right. Meet Dr. Vera Songwe. She is a woman who is essentially saving Africa and I'm not joking about that. She's the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary for the Economic Commission for Africa. She is based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She's superwoman, literally. She works day and night. She convenes all the finance ministers for Africa, runs a task force for COVID in Africa with the powerhouses and leaders of the continent. She is continually innovating and leading the path for debt standstill in Africa. I want to talk a little bit about that. One of the areas she's focused on is the debt crisis. Africa's debt basically is in three buckets, multilateral, bilateral, and commercial debt. The commercial, by the way, is one of the largest on the continent, something like 17 billion US dollars. Africa today, led by Vera, is looking for a standstill of 150 billion US dollars on principal payments so that it has the fiscal space to deal with the crisis. It's Vera who is dealing with key global leaders to make this happen. Late at night, she works on the financial models that will deliver this, and she does it with a vigor and a dedication that from, from my observation, is truly rare. When the crisis hit, the G20 was able to cough up $3 trillion in additional funds in their COVID fiscal and monetary response. The economic devastation hit Africa before the virus even hit the continent. Just think about that for a minute. Oil prices were hit. Emerging market assets were just dumped. Foreign investment withdrawn, $95 billion from stocks and bonds were hit. Remittance accounts tumble, flights were canceled, tourism was shot, food supply chain chains were hit. There was a low demand for products, low capacity in manufacturing, entertainment, utilities, and the transport sectors. Basically budgets were in tatters. So how were African governments to balance the public health response with the risk of economic collapse? That has been something we have truly struggled to grapple with. It's important for us to understand too, and, th and this I really want you to take away, that the economic crisis in Africa has nothing to do with poor macroeconomic policies. There was a recent Financial Times story I liked. It said, this is not about charity. This is about attaining the fiscal space that Africa needs right now. This crisis is not our fault. It came from an external shock that came from Wuhan and was brought to Africa by European travelers. African economies are going into recession for the first time in 25 years. Before COVID, we had longer life expectancy, lower maternal and child mortality. We had built better ports, roads, telecoms, mobile phone penetration, bringing information and banking to the poorest. We have had a huge progress on the continent in fighting poverty and increasing opportunities. Yes, yes, there has been stealing and corruption. But 
overall governments and civil societies are stronger. So Africa debt is, is front and center, but think of it in that context. I want you to meet my friend James Mwangi of Equity Bank and Equity Group Foundation. The groundwork that he's laid over the years in building a new philanthropy model that I had mentioned proved of great impact during this COVID crisis. They are now delivering PPEs throughout the country through bank branches and with the help of employees that are part of the foundation. The foundation has truly evolved under James's leadership in a crisis. And if anyone wants to understand African solutions to African problems, this is it at its best. I admire James greatly. I serve on his EGF International Board. James was one of the top Bloomberg 50 people last year. And this is us having a good time, as he does the hard work, we have the good time. This was in New York as he was acknowledged for his work, not only as a banker, but as a philanthropist who has positioned his foundation well to serve the world and the continent in times of crisis. Through my work with the World Health Organization, I met this man, John Nikesekagom of CDC Africa. This is our man of the moment. He is working around the clock to understand, to explain, and to combat COVID in Africa. Some of our COVID HQ work on our website has been done in collaboration, in fact, uh, with him and with CDC Africa. I need to take a moment here everyone, to mention a true leader that I've had the privilege to be working with, and someone who has supported my efforts with Amplify. Meet Rita Roy of MasterCard Foundation. She has turned the entire focus of the foundation to COVID response and recovery. She is determined to find innovative ways to create jobs and keep young Africans working and doing dignified work. She and her team, led by my friend that you met, Judy Gishuru, are insistent that Africans own and tell their stories around COVID and its impact and penetration. And we are looking for ways on prevention stories on how to get messages out to rural and unconnected parts of the continent. It's been quite clear to me that Rita and MasterCard Foundation are true believers in Africa. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to work with their team in this very important journey that we are all taking together. I'd like to conclude by saying this, Africa is such a wonderful mix of people, of cultures, ethnicities, languages, food and flavors and so much more. I am proud to be African, but I'm also proud to be one of the many who are working tirelessly and many times without key support to make and tell the continent's stories. I am both excited and ready for the challenges that lay ahead. And having these people as my allies in the battle is definitely a plus. The African creative, business, and policy players are all about reclaiming and driving the continent's narrative. We know we will only be able to do this with resilience, with perseverance, and with a fortitude that is open to innovation and one that truly embraces the truth and one that is grounded in reality. I've been asked on many occasions, you know, saying, what is the African story really? My story is the African story. The African story is the story of all the incredible people on the continent. And I ask you to help me and help the rest of the players, some that you've met today and many, many others that are out there to spread that story and to support Africa and support the work that we do. Thank you so much. Take care, stay healthy, wash your hands, and love those near and dear to you. Thank you for your time.